So uh, what are the neuronal mechanisms that are responsible for peripheral vision? And um, now this uh, is going to talk about the more uh, focusing on the property in uh, B1. So um, this is uh, the figure 4.1, uh, chapter uh, four of the Christoph Koch's book, um, which uh, depicts uh, um, different types of the neuronal cell types um, uh, within B1. And here uh, you will note um, uh, two uh, several things. One is that um, you know the type of the neurons are um, really many, and um, one of the most important or well stu uh, uh, studied neuron is called uh, pyramidal cells, and that um, has a shape like this, you know, um, triangular pyramid-like structure of the cell body that typically extends the uh, dendrite, you know, upward, and then that branches a little bit and then projects the axon to the bottom, okay? And then that goes into other areas if it locates into the uh, layer five and so on. And then many of the neurons are much smaller and then some of them are in, uh, smaller neurons tend to be inhibitory and some of them are excitatory. We can't tell from the shape of that. By the way, these uh, pyramidal neurons tend to be um, almost exclusively uh, excitatory, meaning that uh, the neurons that receives the output from these neurons are becoming, you know, more excited and um, generate the spikes. Okay. And then the second component is the uh, mysterious numbers here. And this, and also you can kind of see the band structure here uh, for um, each of the areas actually. And each of the co um, cortex tend to have this, uh, uh, six layer structure, one, two, three, four, and then five, and then six. And then if you ask physiologists, um, sometimes they say that uh, this uh, layer band structure is visible just by the, you know, sort of the microscope, and sometimes you need to do the staining. But um, uh, important thing is that the each layer of the, you know, within the each layer, neurons tend to have a similar connectivity patterns with respect to other layers of the neurons or other cortical areas. And that's, um, uh, that leads to the uh, notion of the hierarchy of the visual cortex, as I explain next. So um, this is a um, um, very important concept in vision science uh, called the cortical hierarchy. And uh, it's uh, proposed by the uh, Fellman and Van Nessen in um, roughly like 30 years ago. So what they, uh, these anatomical uh, um, uh, researchers found was that if the um, uh, layer four, which is um, usually considered as a middle layer, and then layer two and three, that is uh, upper layer, and then five and six is uh, considered as a lower layer. And why we don't have layer one is that the layer one tend to have only axons or dendrites and not the neurons, actually neuron cell bodies. But anyway, the location of the uh, uh, cell bodies, either in the upper or middle or lower, as well as that axon terminals location in the layers can uh, be considered into roughly three types. One type is a forward or ascending, another one is a lateral, and another one is a descending or feedback. So the, by feed forward, what it means is that uh, some kind of the area that projects to, let's say, you know, area V1. In the case of the LGN, you know, we don't have a laminar cortex, but uh, uh, areas are uh, input into cortical area tend to terminate in this mid layer, but not in the upper or lower. And that is true for LGN to V1 case, okay? And V1 to V2 case, that's also like this and so on. So that's called a forward or ascending type connection. On the other hand, descending type connection, such as um, uh, B2 to V4, uh, V2 to V1, or other types of the feedback connection, which is going um, opposite of this ascending direction, that tends to originate from um, upper or lower area, lower layers, and then terminate in the upper or lower layer. It could be coming from only lower layer and then terminate in both. That's a typical descending projection. 
And the lateral corresponds to the similar uh, level of the hierarchy, such as um, the most prominent is uh, probably MT to B4 or something like that. I'm not an anatomist, so I may be uh, wrong about this, but um, these uh, tend to have uh, uh, upper or lower areas uh, of the uh, origin and then projects across all the uh, layers. And then based on these types of the um, uh, terminal projections, uh, what uh, Feldman and Van Nessen did is um, to uh, generate some kind of maps. So that uh, corresponds to this, uh, sometimes called the Feldman Van Nessen diagram. It looks like on the trains, you know, uh, uh, line or very complicated metropolitan uh, roadmap, but um, it is uh, according to this, you know, anatomical uh, hierarchical uh, assign uh, assignment rule, it is constructed. And here you know that, you know, retina initially uh, goes to, you know, LGN. And by the way, hierarchy is um, uh, assigned from bottom to the top in this way. And then LGN projects to B1 in this way. And then uh, B2 is located above B1. And then from there, many different kind of areas uh, exist. And what we talk mostly in the lecture is like B4 and MT. MT is for the visual motion and B4 is for color and the object recognition. And also the clusters of inferotemporal cortex called IT, as well as the uh, intraparietal areas, oh, and so 7A, 7B, this is a called parietal areas. And then uh, uh, here is a hippocampus that is famous for uh, memory, okay? And this type of the hierarchy can be assigned by uh, having this uh, anatomical connective pattern across the layers. And for now, uh, we, we just stop here and we will come back to this type of issue later. Okay, so then the, uh, another uh, important uh, structure of the uh, cortex uh, is that uh, um, V1 neurons have a um, different kind of a tuning. Okay, so unlike a uh, receptive field for um, uh, retinal ganglion cells, this neuron, for example, let's say, you know, if you are fixating up here, then um, the neurons might respond to the stimulus that is presented somewhere here, bottom right, okay? And then it's not only the location, but also the type of the stimulus that matters. And it took a really long time for the neurophysiologists to realize this, and that led to the uh, Nobel laureate uh, discovery of the uh, Huber and the Wiesel, and you might have heard of this type of story, so I'll cut, uh, omit it. But what they discovered is that uh, not only showing some of the uh, you know, um, stimulus in this receptive field location, but you need to have a proper stimulus. And in the case of the V1, uh, the proper uh, means many different things, but for example, it's the direction of the motion and also line orientation. Here, this particular neuron responds really strongly and the onset response with this angle of the line, and it's responding only to this direction, but not in this direction. Okay, and then if you change the orientation, then you find that you know this um, direction is really optimum for this neuron, and that's called the direction selective cell in the V1. Okay, so. The higher the hierarchy a neuron locates in the uh, area of the brain, it tends to have a bigger size of the receptive field. And that's because of this you know, convergence uh, property of the neurons. So any given neuron tend to have an uh, uh, input from uh, you know, thousands of the neurons and that uh, represents each different sp spatial location. So the V1 neurons tend to have a bigger receptive field compared to LGN or retinal ganglion cells, and B2 has a slightly bigger, and B4 even bigger, and the IT is much, much bigger. And we'll come to that. And that's related to the concept of attention, as you will see. The second <laughs> is that the, the higher the neuron locates uh, in the hierarchy, the property of the response uh, that optimize a neuron's firing becomes more and more complicated. 
And here you will see that you know direction and the orientation of the line that that was not uh, present in the receptive field structure of the LGN or retinal ganglion cells. And then if you go to V2, it adds something, and go to MT, it adds something. And the bulk of the neurophysiology has been spending on um, uh, spent to discover this you know, complication of the receptive field um, uh, across many areas, and that's still going on. Okay. Then the third uh, important uh, neuronal structure of the V1 uh, is that uh, uh, what we found, uh, what we, uh, what I did, uh, um, already, you know, mentioned was this vertical direction of the layer structure, but here horizontally. Um, the neurons are receptive field properties become similar across the horizontal direction. Okay, and that's called the columnar structure in the cortex. And in the V1, there is two, at least in a prominent uh, columnar structure that can be visualized by many different kinds of um, uh, uh, experiment. The one is ocular dominance, and that becomes important for the next week binocular rivalry lecture. So what it means is that at the layer four, uh, for example, within V1, neurons within this left or right columns of the, uh, you know, um, uh, columns are locating, you know, this area, they tend to respond only um, uh, input from the left eye, but not to the right eye. And then here, you know, neurons respond to only right eye, but not to the left eye. Okay, that's the ocular dominance column. And further, within the ocular dominance column, there is an orientation column. So here, you know, the neurons uh, respond only to the horizontal line. Here, uh, neurons respond only to the vertical line. Just to make it clear. So this one is horizontal and this one is the vertical. And some of them uh, only responds to, let's say, you know, this direction of the motion, but, you know, uh, Sometimes this is even split, and then this half responds more to this direction. This portion uh, responds to the, the other side. It's a direction of uh, uh, dominance and column as well. That's also discovered in the V1. Okay. And uh, here is the um, just you know peak, uh, peaking of the for the future uh, lectures, but the, uh, orientation column structure for the MT. Uh, this is MT. Um, on the left side is MT, is uh, both um, motion direction as well as uh, the depth of the uh, plane. You know, if the motion is happening near you or a farther away, um, that also uh, has a tuning or a property of the receptive field is dependent on this kind of properties. And this one uh, that looks a very complicated uh, um, column, that's called uh, in, uh, inferior temporal uh, cortex, and they have um, a cluster of the neurons located within this area that responds to monkey face or some kind of shades of the circle or a tube, um, um, uh, the, the sphere, and then elongated, you know, uh, circular shape and so on. Um, uh, so that's found in IT. Okay, so that, that's, you know, the three the important feature of the V1, layer structure and the more complex, uh, complex receptive field type and then columnar structure. And then um, another uh, important uh, property of um, transformation from um, LGM to V1 uh, concerns um, how does the visual image map onto V1? And this becomes very important when we consider the phenomenology and the property of the V1 here. And uh, in an upshot, um, I will introduce this concept of the retinotopy and the cortical magnification. Okay, how does it work? So if you are focusing on the right visual field, let's say, you know, you are looking at the center here and then don't move your eyes, then uh, let's imagine that you are in looking at with uh, your right eye. And then there are blind, uh, there is a blind spot here, roughly 10 to 12, uh, 15 degrees of the eccentricity. 
And then there, you know, you don't have any, you know, um, um, or, or retinal ganglion cells for the right eye that responds to this part of the brain, uh, the part of the visual field, okay? Visual field uh, refers to the outside of the world. And then uh, this gray area is the one that you can see only with your right eye. And then uh, the white side is the one that you can also see with your left eye. So you can check by closing your right eye or left eye, you know, your visual field actually changes. You know, the most, you know, um, uh, farther away is only accessible with the right eye for the right visual field. Okay, and then now, what happens uh, when the uh, image goes uh, transformed into the V1? So this is the, you know, final figure. Here, uh, there are several in, uh, important things happening. So in V1, the world is not projected like this, you know, half circle. First of all, that's a very important thing. It looks like elongated, you know, ellipse kind of shape. And if you know the mathematics, this is called a log, uh, uh, complex log mapping. What it means is that uh, it emphasizes the representation of phobia. Let's say this is a 2.5 degree, so it only corresponds to this much of the phobia of the right side, projects it into the, also by the way, uh, this goes onto the, uh, the other side of the cortex, cortex. Okay, left primary visual cortex. And this gets mapped to this large uh, spot. On the other hand, this 40 degree and everything else gets projected even smaller than central 2.5 uh, uh, degree, visual degree angle. And then blind spot gets projected here and then this part is dominated by the um, uh, input from the left eye, actually. And then you'll see that, you know, uh, roughly 10 degree of the visual angle, which is roughly speaking half of the display size on your, you know, laptop uh, with uh, arms um, um, distance. That already explains 50% of the V1. corresponds to 10 degree visual angle, okay? So that's very important facts about the V1 mapping. If I uh, uh, take stock of everything that I have told you from retina to LGN to uh, primary visual cortex, here is the um, uh, important figure, okay? And I'll ask it in the um, uh, quiz. Assume that this person is looking at the center of the display like this. And then the right visual field gets projected on the left side of the, each of the eye. And then the left visual field gets projected on the right side of the eye. So this is just, you know, same as, you know, the principle of a camera, you know, all the uh, image gets, you know, inverted through the lens here. And then uh, after the crossing of the optic chiasma, it turns out that you know all the things that you see on the right side of your fixation gets to left LGN and projects to left V1. On the other hand, all the things that you see on the left visual field gets to map onto the right LGN and then right V1. This is very important, okay? And you can already imagine that, you know, many of the folk psychological or folk neuroscientific notion of uh, right uh, brain doing calculation and the left brain doing arts uh, doesn't make sense even from this you know, perspective, but I will go into the detail of that uh, in the later lecture. Okay, so uh, now if you consider this fact, then how does um, the figure like this projects to the brain? That's a question. Let's assume that we are looking at, you know, nose of this person, okay? And then it should be the case that, you know, right side of the, this figure, including this, you know, uh, left hand of the person projects onto left visual BB1, and then the left hemisphere, left visual field, 
should the projects on to the right V1. Okay. The reason why I cover this part with a, a question mark is because this uh, figure has a little bit of the mistake and um, it's actually really uh, common that many neuroscientists and psychologists don't get this. Uh, so be careful about this um, on the website, you know, based uh, information. Okay. Um, so just to recap again, um, let's go step by step. The V1 right visual field corresponds uh, goes to the left visual cortex and it's upside down and the left uh, right is uh, flipped okay so um if we start with this you know uh image outside at the retina it's all flipped upside down and the left and right and then the left side of the v1 projects or processes this side of the thing okay and that's also enhanced or sort of the uh, magnified at the small part of the retina like this it's gross but that's that's how your visual cortex v1 represents or responds in um this response uh the out of, outside of stimulus and then also you know just to, just to recap or you know to make sure what you are understanding in a, you know uh, more uh, fully this kind of simpson uh, uh, picture when you are looking at this uh, homer's uh, eyes here with your fixation then uh, the left and the right b1 should project the image like this first of all what you see at the fovea, the homer gets represented like this, and then everything on the top right gets uh, projected into the bottom left of the V1, and then uh, uh, other things you can check. So it's all uh, uh, flipped back and uh, you know top and uh, bottom and the left and right. Okay, so what are the implications for the conscious vision? So um, one question um, you might ask is that why do we not see the image upside down like you know uh, our visual cortex is you know projecting? It sounds silly question, but it's not. And also, uh, in the end, it will um, lead to the hard problem actually. Okay. Secondary, um, you might ask why do we not see the image? Um, in a distorted way, like you know, Simpsons, you know, projection onto the V1. What we experience is not the mirror image, and also, um, in a sense, you know, not the flip and the, uh, flip up and down, and also left and right, but the actual reflection of the world in itself. Um, this is not really uh, straightforward, and in fact. If you have never uh, learned anything about the brain, this might come as a um, potentially you know, surprising thing. In fact, Arist Aristotle is to, uh, said to be um, hypothesizing that you know um, everything we should we see should have some kind of correspondence uh, in his uh, terms, isomorphic correspondence in our head. But of course, you know we now know that you know a red circular thing. Uh, outside does not, you know, have the circular red thing in the brain. So it's clearly not the case. But what? Is, why is not the case? It's not really simple kind of a question. I mean, if you are asked by the kid, uh, how do you respond? It. I, I, um, I can't really, you know, offer a really good um, answer actually. And now, uh, you know, as I said, the fovea is hugely enlarged in V1, but uh, uh, so that means uh, also, uh, um, are we actually not seeing much of the periphery? That's also another thing that you might actually uh, infer from this type of the um, uh, data. And in fact, this is a really good conjecture. Although, you know, uh, we do seem to have at least a space outside, and I don't think we see very well and that uh, fact that we don't see very well corresponds to the trunk representation in v1 but why 
the space itself seems uniform, whereas the representation gets crowded or you know sparse. That's not super clear, really. Okay. So uh, to summarize, this part of the lecture said that you know uh, cortex is vertically layered and horizontally displaying um, the uh, columnar organization. And at the higher hierarchy, the receptive field becomes bigger in size and more complex in its property. And the cortical magnification and the retinotopy, which is you know the correspondence between the outside world to the brain, uh, represents the first step uh, to the hard problem. What is the link between the neurons and the phenomenology? Okay. And then uh, another uh, part of the summary is that the cortical representation of the phobia is huge in V1. Up to 2.5 degree visual angle corresponds to 20 to 25% of V1. And the good number to remember is 10 degree visual angle corresponds to the 50% of V1. And what does it mean about our impression of consciousness in the periphery? And uh, then this, all of this, you know, summary, in a sense, I assumed or sort of implied that V1 is related to our conscious vision. But is it really the case? That's the question that we are going to address in the next week. Okay, but we we have several things to do for the rest of the week, uh, uh, this week's lecture. So that's the next one. Okay, these are the important topics which will be coming back again in the next lectures.